Good morning. Welcome to St. James. We are glad you are here together in worship today. As you entered the sanctuary, hopefully you received a copy of our worship bulletin. On the back of the bulletin, there's a calendar of ministry opportunities this week. And just before that, there's some written announcement about uh, upcoming ministry opportunities throughout the month and in the days ahead. One item that is not listed there is the ski retreat that's happening in February. Uh, that went out yesterday in our e-newsletter, and there was one typo in that. If you did not register and would like to register for that, you can still do that. Actually, uh, registration is open through Christmas for that. Uh, it's not just for youth, it's for others who would like to go as well. It is February 14th through the 16th. This Wednesday night will be our last Wednesday night supper before uh, Christmas. The menu is printed there. After the dinner, we'll have some time to do some Christmas uh, cookie and other craft making. So if you would like to join us, please let us know by tomorrow at noon. If you are interested in the St. James Women's Retreat, uh, please let us know as soon as possible so we can be sure we have enough space for everybody who is interested in that. That retreat will be February 1st. It's just a one-day retreat on a Saturday. There are uh, many upcoming special opportunities for Sunday school and for worship. The times for our Christmas Eve services are printed there. Uh, another item just to sort of put on your calendar is Wednesday the 18th. We will not have Wednesday night supper that evening, but we are planning a longest night worship service. It's a time when we remember those who uh, are going through grief and a uh, sense of loss during the holidays. Uh, that will be here in the sanctuary that evening. This time I'd like to invite you to stand and greet one another in the peace of Jesus Christ. As we continue to worship together, I invite you to return to your seats and to take a few moments to pause and reflect on God's presence here in our midst. Please stand as you're able for the call to worship, which is inside of your worship bulletin. Sing and rejoice, O daughter Zion, for lo, I will come and dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst. Our first hymn is number 211, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and we'll sing the first, fourth, sixth, and seventh verses. <laughs>
you may be seated, and if you will, join us in the Advent lighting that is printed in your bulletin. In the season of Advent, we worship and wait. As we worship, we know some things cannot wait. Joy cannot wait. Joy is a sign of our new life in God. God's joy. Last week, we lit a candle as a symbol of hope. Today, we light one candle as a symbol of joy. Let us enter God's presence with joy. Inside of your bulletin, you'll see a shaded area with our prayer concerns. If there's ever anything we can pray with you about, don't hesitate to write it on one of the prayer cards in the pew or to talk to one of the pastors or call the church office. Today, we lift up Ken Johnson, Ann Barron, Sandra Bottoms, Bill Chestnut, Virgie Cunningham, Tricia Evans, Jean Frazier, Monty Shackelford, and Ann Gladley. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy One, we thank you for this season of waiting, this season of preparation, preparing our heart and minds not only for the baby, but for his second coming. We thank you that in the midst of darkness, there is a bright light. We pray for joy, joy that embodies everything we do and who we are. We pray that we might be able to sing the song of Mary. We pray that we might be able to do the work of bringing justice and hope and love and joy to the world. We thank you for this time of worship, of gathering as the community of God. Make us ready for the coming of your reign, when you will bring everlasting joy. It is in your name we pray, and in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today comes from the prophet Isaiah, the 35th chapter, which can be found on page 811 in your pew Bible. This is the word of the Lord. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like a crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make them firm, and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear, here is your God. He will come with vengeance. With terrible recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped, and the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless shall sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. A burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackal shall become like a swamp, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. 
A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the Holy Way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now let us affirm our faith in our God with the statement of faith of the United Church of Canada, which can be found on page 883. Please stand. I believe we are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated, and I invite the ushers to come forward. If you are visiting with us this morning, we hope that you'll fill out one of these gold cards, which you can find in the pew back, and either hand them to myself or Max after worship, or drop them in the offering plate. Let us give to God.
Our gospel lesson today comes from the gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter, beginning in the 46th verse. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown the strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud through the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors to Abraham and his descendants forever. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. You may be seated. Have you ever tried to keep joy hidden? It can be pretty difficult. Isaiah, in the song that Anna Kate read, says it's like joy just bubbles up into singing. You just can't stop the singing. It's hard to keep joy hidden. In the song of Mary that we just heard, Mary breaks forth into singing because she is so overwhelmed by a sense of God's presence and the wonders of what God is beginning. It can be hard to keep joy hidden. And part of what these two texts seem to be coming together to say to us is when that happens, then just let it go in song. One of the activities we gave the children to do to, during the service today is to read both of these passages and mark how many, not mark in the Bible, but mark down on their bulletin or on their sheet of paper how many times the word joy or rejoices is used. Mary singing erupts when she goes to visit her cousin, Elizabeth. It's after she has been visited by the angel, and the angel tells Mary that she is going to give birth to the Messiah. When Mary wonders how this will be, what will be the sign that this is to take place, the angel says, the sign is your cousin, Elizabeth. Go and see, because she also is about to bear a child. Mary and Elizabeth are almost mirror images of each other. One is young, engaged, but not yet married, but told she is about to have this miraculous birth. Elizabeth, her cousin, has been married for years and seems to be at the age where many think childbearing is no longer possible. She and her husband, Zachariah, have not had any children, but now she is going to give birth to John the Baptist. And when they come together, Mary and Elizabeth, after their greeting, Mary cannot contain her joy, and she breaks forth into this song of praise, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. When you look at the wider context of the days when Mary and Elizabeth greet each other, when you look at the background of when Isaiah is talking about this highway, this holy way, this God interstate that those who travel this road cannot stop singing, it doesn't seem like the best of circumstances. 
Isaiah is active. He is a prophet in a time when, when the Israelites fear that a foreign empire is about to come and take over their land. When Mary sings her song about magnifying the Lord and rejoicing in God as her Savior, Augustus is still the Roman emperor and Herod is still the king. Yet something is happening, something is beginning, something captivates these people in such a way that they do not ignore these circumstances but they can't help singing. In fact, Isaiah's song even tells us that the sorrow and sighing hasn't quite ended yet. But we are traveling away, we are traveling on a road where we look for the day when sorrow and sighing will cease. This may be a good time to remember that we are still in a day and an age where there is much sorrow and sighing. As we hear about these miraculous births to these two amazing women, two women at different stages in life, it may be a good time to remember that not all stories end that way. We have to be careful at this time of year in telling these stories to realize that there are those who have longed for children whose longings have never been answered. And there are those whose children have been too quickly taken away. Sorrow and sighing has not yet ended and that is all the more reason we need to hear these songs. Because these songs help us to rise above the turmoil, the danger, the threats. To keep our eyes focused on something that we can fix our hope and our hearts on. The chance to walk with God. That's what Isaiah says makes the difference on this God interstate is God will be with us. That's why Mary can't contain her joy because even amidst the days of Caesar Augustus and King Herod, she feels the movements of God's presence in her life. As we journey throughout these days of Advent, there begins to take birth within us a sense of hope, a sense of joy that we cannot contain. Even amidst the sorrow and sighing of our own days. Monday, as I was leaving, going home, I remembered it was a uh, the birthday of one of my good friends. My friend uh, for years has been a music director in churches, so when I dialed her number and she answered the phone, I was very hesitant to sing happy birthday to her, but I did it anyway, and she seemed to enjoy it. At the end of the singing, she couldn't even let me finish, really, before she had to tell me about her daughter. Her daughter has been on my prayer list for a while, her daughter had been on, uh, his daughter is pregnant and had been on bed rest and pretty strict medical care. Just that morning on my friend's birthday, they had released her daughter from that bed rest and placed her back on just normal medical care for a pregnancy. And my friend said it was the best birthday gift. Thursday morning as I was driving into work, I heard a ping on my phone, and when I got to the parking lot, I picked up my phone, and it was a message from my friend saying her daughter was back in the hospital. She is just barely six months pregnant, and her water broke in the middle of the night, and the doctors are doing all they can to delay the birth so that the baby can develop further.
Sorrow and sign has not yet ended. There are still the threats and dangers around us. When I called my friend that afternoon, I was not at all surprised that she began the conversation with a song. It was a very familiar hymn. My hope is built on nothing less. It wasn't as joyful, as jubilant as she often sings, but it was the bedrock that gave her the strength to go on. Isaiah and Mary Do not ask us to deny the pain and the suffering that are around us, the pain and suffering that we may go through, that we may experience ourselves. But they do ask us to lift our hearts and our eyes to the presence of God in our midst. Mary describes it as picking up a magnifying glass and looking at the signs of God's presence among us. And when we can spot that, there's a joy that sometimes comes over us and we just can't hold it back. It breaks forth into singing. This summer, I was privileged to go with our youth group on their mission trip to the Bahamas. The group I was working with worked with Miss Brenda Lee every day. We were re-roofing, They were re-roofing her house. I was on the ground painting. Almost every afternoon after we would come back from our lunch break and in the hottest part of the day as we would try to resume our work for a few hours, Miss Brenda Lee would drag a chair out into the front yard underneath a shade tree and she would start singing for us. It was quite a scene. Ms. Brenda Lee lost one leg when she was a teenager, so she gets by with a crutch and her other leg. She would try to bring the chair out on her own, and one of us would often run up and take it to her shade tree for her. And then she would just sit out there. She would sometimes be sitting, her house was at an intersection of two roads and we often teased her that she was holding court because everybody who came to that stop sign had to greet Miss Brenda Lee because you could not greet Brenda Lee. She had such a cheery disposition. But in between the cars and the greetings, she would sing to encourage us in our work. On our last day, we had lunch sitting out under that tree, and Miss Brenda Lee had already come out, and we realized we weren't going to finish everything we wanted to get done on her house. And Christy Hunt, who was with us, one of the other adults, said, Miss Brenda Lee, what can we do for you before we leave? Today is our last day to be here with you. And she said, I wish you would just sing with me. And I had been lecturing the children all week that there was no way we could finish everything that needed to be done on that house. There was too much for us to tackle it all. We had to remember there were groups coming behind us the next week and they would continue until the work was done or until the money ran out and the resources were gone. We needed to be sensitive to interacting with the people we were there to help and the people we were serving but in those last few hours, I saw all how close we were to finishing certain projects and it was hard for me to step away and to circle up with the rest of that crowd and Miss Brenda Lee. But those 15 minutes of singing were like heaven on earth. I think it was the best thing we did all week. Miss Brenda Lee began by by choosing a song and we quickly joined in. And then 
one of the children picked a song and she would try to join us on that. It was not only good for our souls, but as other people came through that interstate, they would stop and and just pause for a minute with their windows down, listening to our voices. And I realized that we were doing something, we were witnessing in a way we hadn't been able to witness all week through the hammers and the paintbrushes. As other people stopped to see how joy can catch on and renew our spirits. It's just hard to keep joy hidden. Several years ago, uh, we were uh, at a comedy show and I remember the comedian telling a story that's always kind of stayed with me. His theory is that in every household there's an unwritten rule. No one can be happier than the least happy person in the home. That is, if you come home, and let's say on the happiness scale, you're an eight, but your spouse is maybe a three, maybe not had the day you had, then eventually what will happen is that three will beat you down to their level because it's just not possible to be happier than the least happy person in the house. That poor comedian never heard Mary sing. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. You just can't beat that down. Thanks be to God. Our final hymn is number 202, People Look East. Let us stand to sing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The countenance of the Lord fall upon each and every one of you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.